Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys can grab a seat. It's good to meditate on the character of God. Isn't that so? Lord, we just want to come before you this morning and ask you to open up our eyes, to open up our minds, to open up our hearts, that we might perceive you for who you are, the Holy loving, omnipotent God who's with us, who's for us, who's in us. Take a hold of us today and help us to see what you've done, what you're doing, and what you're calling us to do that we might fulfill your will, that we might give you glory. So as I teach today, I'm just asking that you would come and you would would speak to us, that you would instruct us by your very spirit, through your word, that we would walk with you, that we would testify of you. So do what needs to be done. We, We don't even know the insight, the correction, the rebuke, the consolation. But would you speak your truth to us right now? For your glory and for our joy. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. When he had entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? That's a summary of the triumphal entry by by Matthew. Who is this? Now, this is an interesting question because Jesus has been there, right? Jesus has been there at least three different times during during Passover. This is his third time during Passover, presenting truth, declaring truth, revealing things, performing miracles, and yet a lot of people still didn't know who he was. And it's an interesting thing for us to think about because we're in a culture that's got lots and lots of churches and lots and lots of radio stations and lots and lots of Bibles, but there's still a lot of people who could say, who is this? And there's a lot of people who've been turned off by somebody else's projection of what it means to be a believer or a Christian. And not everyone knows why it is that believers see Jesus the way we do. But today we're going to look in here in the Gospel of John chapter 12. And I I want you to discover that Jesus has something to show you. And to let you see him for who he is. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 12. And then just let me tell you, I mean, I put all those references in your notes for a reason. I had a brother tell me how he was reading through them this week. Man, that encourages me because that putting all these references down takes a little more time to let you know, here's where I got this all from, but I can't take you to all those because most of you don't want to stay the whole afternoon, okay? So, so... We're going to refer to these other references, but John's going to be our primary. John chapter 12, verse 12. 
<clears throat> it says, on the next day, so what's the next day? All right. Jesus was in Bethany six days before the Passover. Remember, he had performed that healing on Lazarus sometime before. They then threw a feast, at a, a big festival, a celebration of it. Mary's anointed his, his feet with, with perfume. And then it says, on the next day. Do you know God's got a timetable he's working on in your life? And you may have no idea what it is. <laughs> But he does. He knows what he's working on. So it says, On the next day, there was a large crowd who had come to the feast. And when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And these things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, <clears throat> then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. And for this reason also, the people went and met him because they heard that, they, that he had performed this sign. And the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you're not doing any good. <laughs> Look, the world has gone after him. Jesus comes into Jerusalem and it stirs the city. Why? Because of the response of the crowd. There's something going on here that's, that's very, very significant. It's, this is not the, an average day. This was a day that had been foretold thousands of years before. This is a day that had been particularly explained 480 years before but I want you to think about this. How you and I respond to Jesus daily is communicating a message to those around us. When they were saying, who is this? Why were they asking that question? Because some of these people were really excited about Jesus. And frankly... Some of you ain't. And there's things, some of you got excited about basketball yesterday. Or hockey. Or we have things we get excited about. Is Jesus one of those? And if it's not, why not? Because this is the most glorious thing. So he comes in Jerusalem. So here's this principle I want you to see. Jesus entered Jerusalem precisely as was foretold, verifying that he is the Messiah. God always keeps his promises. Amen. Is Mike the only person that believes that this morning? God always keeps his promises. That's, that's a little better. Some of you are not convincing. Hey, hey we're in friends. They, they we don't have to be afraid of being excited about Jesus here, do we? But, but there ought to be this, when we realize who it is that's faithful to us, there ought to be, whew, there ought to be a heart of worship. That would be a, there's a celebration when you recognize who you're coming to. And know my wife was gone for several days this week taking care of mom, you know. But when she came home, I'd be happy. That's what I'm telling you. I'm not, oh, nice to see you. Ah. Listen. God always keeps his promises. And God's promises have particulars. 
He's explained things, articulated things. The crowd is shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now, until this point, Jesus has carefully, it seems, avoided letting this message be declared. God has not stirred this up in people. People would try to make him king at another spot here or there. There's different things that came about. But the idea of publicly declaring this was not allowed. Jesus would actually, don't tell anybody. He performed miracles. Hey, just keep quiet about this. So don't pass this around. Why? Because God has a timetable. You know that. You've got a timetable. And it's never this little thing we wear on our wrist. Okay? It just doesn't work that way. But God is never late. It seems sometimes seldom early, but, <laughs> but God is never late. Okay? So, so it says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes, interesting, in the name of the Lord. And what was Jesus' name? Yeshua. Yahweh saves. This is the name. Salvation has come to them. He's declaring it by his very person. And they were saying, Hosanna. That's Lord save. It was this declaration and a request that would be given to a king. It was the idea of exalting a king to acknowledge that he has the rule and right to reign. And at this point, that has never been given to the son of David. And yet now it is. So this is, this is this critical moment. So he enters Jerusalem precisely as was foretold. And it says in John, okay, and every one of the, the gospel writers by the Holy Spirit allow their personality, their perspective to flow through. It's, it's amazing when you study your gospels and correlate these ones. But John says, Jesus finding a donkey sat on it. Okay, but if you look over in Matthew, you look over in Luke, it, it, there's a more detailed story about the donkey, okay? In fact, you read it, he'll say, as they were coming to, to Bethage, okay, this is just as you come up onto the Mount of Olives, Bethage would have been to the, I'm not sure, the left or the right, Wayne, on, which, which side was it? But just, just shortly outside of Jerusalem, okay? And he sent him over and said, hey, go over here and get this donkey's colt. And when you get there, some people are going to say, hey, what are you doing with the donkey? And you just tell them, the master has you, has, has use for it. He, he, master intends to use this. It's amazing that Jesus was sharing some truth with his disciples even as he gave them directions. Do you understand that? Because he was telling them, I know it all. How can you say, oh, just, just go over here. There's going to be a donkey. It'll be tied up. They're going to pick it up. You're going to ask this. He knows what to answer. Can you trust your life to a God who knows that kind of things about this world? I, th I just think that's amazing. All right. And so they go. They're on assignment to get what? A donkey. Hooey. Now, I know some of you know a little bit about donkeys. I'm here to tell you, even those who know a lot about donkeys don't speak that highly of donkeys all the time. But they're actually extremely smart, very strong, very helpful animals. But I'm not so sure these guys would have been that excited <laughs> about the donkey. But obedience to Christ's directions lets him use you in his plans. They were sent to get a donkey may not sound very impressive to, to you, but do you realize that if they did not have the donkey, that the word of God would not have been fulfilled? That the purpose of God would not have been accomplished? Going to get the donkey was part of God's plan for them, that they would be a part of the fulfillment of God's plan for centuries. Don't underestimate power of obedience in your life to accomplish God's purpose. You do not know what will be done if you do what God tells you to do.
but God does. And he told you to. Right? You know, I can remember parents telling me, hey, you, know, you need to do what you're told. <laughs> and you knew what would be done if you didn't do what you were told. <laughs> but you didn't understand what they were trying to shape into you when they sent you out to do your chores, when they sent you out to do different things. But you realize later, isn't that right? When you look back, you realize, my parents were shaping me. They were doing things that were good for me. It didn't feel good to me at the time. And God gives us directions and God calls us to obedience. God calls us to love and to forgive and to serve and to speak. And you may say, it doesn't feel comfortable, but I'm here to tell you that the Heavenly Father knows what's good for us. Amen? He knows. Did the disciples understand what Jesus was doing? Look down there in verse 16. <laughs> These things the disciples what? Did not understand. Encouragement for us. Okay. <laughs> okay. A lot of times we don't always get what Jesus is doing. All right. But it says, when Jesus was glorified, okay, that's ascended into heaven, resurrected and ascended, then they remembered these things. Freebie question why did they remember those things? Because the Holy Spirit was given and he was the reminder. You have a Holy Spirit that can be your reminder, and some of you need a better reminder than your mind right now. You, you know who you are, but it ain't working the same way. But the Holy Spirit can still help you remember what you need to remember. I just drawn to this for a second this week, or so I'm going to stay here for a second. It, obey God when you don't know why you should, other than he's God. That's good enough. But I want to encourage you with the fact is, is God's doing something through your obedience. And you may or may not see it for some time. But can you imagine the two guys? They don't even make the, the, the cover story in any of the Gospels. No name mentioned who got donkey assignment. All right. But can you imagine the two guys when they realized it after Christ had ascended, and they went, oh, well, we were a part of the plan of God. Wasn't that so cool? Do you remember those people harassing us about picking up the donkey? Do you remember how the donkeys were pulling sideways? Do you Obey him. So what did that do? Look what it says here. They took these branches, they came out to meet him, began to say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So they're acknowledging Jesus Christ as king. Why? Because it was written, verse 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Jesus fulfilled prophecies precisely confirming his identity. It wasn't a vague thing. It was a specific thing, very precise, like a fingerprint, okay? You know, a fingerprint, they, they take this image of the oil or grease off your finger that's left on a surface, and it's unique. It's unique to you, and they can identify you based on your fingerprint. Isn't that right? The prophecies that God put into the Old Testament showed us, so to speak, the fingerprints of the Messiah. Does that make any sense to you? So that when you look and say, okay, if, if he does this, if he does this, if he does this, oh, we know who that is. See, Jesus did not want you to have any doubt, any question in your mind that Jesus was who he said he was, who God sent him to be and do for us. He wanted us to have a confidence in that. You, do, you ought not to be doubting, but if you are, go ahead and ask the questions because there's answers. God is not afraid of questions. Questions are good because you ask the right questions, you're going to grow, all right? But the quote was from Zechariah 9.9. Why don't you read it with me? Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just 
and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Is that fairly specific? Hey, who, who are you looking for coming in? Well, look for the guy that's riding the donkey. But then, not just anybody can ride a donkey. There's this whole character about his life that has to be confirmed as well. But he didn't just ride any donkey. He rode a donkey's colt. Now, some of you know, whether it's horses or donkeys, when you come into town on a donkey that's never been ridden on before, you're about to take a ride. Normally speaking, you're about to take a ride. Okay? And then think about what this would be like because there's people taking branches and waving them in front of them. Okay? Do not do that to a horse unless you want to launch somebody that's riding it. That's how it works, friends. Okay? And then there's people throwing coats down. Have you ever watched how a horse or a donkey will react to something that they don't recognize that's on the ground? They do not, they'll walk around the dust. This is a miracle of confirmation taking place in just the event itself and just how it worked. This couldn't happen this way. This was saying, oh, wow, it's a God thing. You ever notice that in your life? You go, oh, that was a God thing. That didn't just happen. That wasn't just a circumstance. That was, that was God moving. All right, so, so this prophecy from Zechariah, he wrote that a couple of weeks before Jesus rode in the town, right? 480 years before he rode in the town, okay? For those of you that are into your history, okay, that just go ahead and date yourself back. What was going on 480 years ago? You, you can't recall. Henry VIII was getting married and divorced for the fifth time, Okay. There's all sorts of things going on in the world, but, but it's so far back, you just go, you wouldn't. How could they know? God knows it all. Is that your God? Is, is that the one you're resting in, the one who knows it all, the one who's in charge, the one who's working it through? <laughs> and they were so excited, you know, the Jews, had, had the law came through Moses, but Moses himself had also given one of the fingerprints. In Deuteronomy 18.15, we have this declaration. Read it with me. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. To him you shall listen. What did they say? When they said, who is this? Do you know what the answer was? This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Everybody knew he was a prophet. It had already been confirmed. Listen, God works in our history. And this is exciting because I know some of you are like, oh, he left the revelation. <laughs> we'll get back there, Lord willing. But you know one of the other fingerprints? I can't go, go through them all, but Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, you know what Daniel did? Daniel dated the entry of the Messiah by the prophet, by the Spirit of God. He dated the entry. It's something for you to, to check out. Daniel chapter 9, 25 and 26. And he's talking about this city that the Messiah is going to come into. But when Daniel's talking about the city of Jerusalem that, that, that the Messiah is going to come into, guess what? The city doesn't exist. It's been destroyed by Babylon. It's, tore, it's, it's completely tore down. There is no temple. And he says, oh, the Messiah's going to come. And then he, it's interesting. You read that story. He's going to get cut off. His procession and his execution was written down in Daniel 530 years before it ever happened. And he says, there's a king that's going to declare this. Do you know who it was? Cyrus. Cyrus declared it. He was named by Isaiah the prophet. And Daniel was in the administration of Cyrus. Amazing stuff. God works, friends. Why am I telling you all this? Because you can trust God. 
What were those people singing? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know that scripture? Look in your Bible, you'll usually see the font will change. That's, that's Psalms 118. That's what? That's another fingerprint. Do you guys see this? You only got five fingers. They're all there. It's, it's this imprint on prophecy after prophecy that confirmed that Jesus Christ is our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord. You can believe what the Word declares because God miraculously confirmed it to them and to us. True? That's the truth. But I want you to know something. When we do that, it doesn't always make everybody happy. <laughs> right? Verse 19 says, So the Pharisees said to one another, See, you're not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. When they were shouting, Hosanna in the temple, it's talked about over there in Luke. And what did the Pharisees say? Jesus. Tell your disciples to shut up! And some of you used to talk to your kids that way. I hope not, but some of you did. All right? What was Jesus' answer to the instruction of shut them up? He said, if they shut up, the very rocks are going to shout. The whole creation is going to celebrate. This, this day, this day, is an appointed day. It's a great read. Check that out in Luke 19. He comes over the city, and we're thinking, hey, this is the triumphal entry. It was not the triumphal entry for Jesus. It was a grievous time. He was weeping over that city because he knew what was coming next. They were going to reject him, and in 70 AD, over a million Jews were slaughtered when the Romans came through, and then the rest scattered into the world as slaves. Because they rejected their Messiah. Listen. When we share Jesus with people, it can create a discomfort. Why? Because you and I are telling them Jesus is Lord, right? Which is Jesus is King. Jesus is the boss. But when you declare that to people, guess what? They've already got one. And they kind of think they like him. And it's them. They, see, they see themselves as in charge. And when you start talking about it, you're saying Jesus needs to be the person in charge. And they're saying, no, no, I, I've already got a boss, and I kind of like how it works. And so it bothers people when we talk about Jesus sometimes. Don't, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. Because telling the truth about Jesus to people and having that bother them is a way to reveal to them there's a need for change. And sometimes it actually, even the offense will show a person, I've got a problem. But we don't have to be offensive. <laughs> now hear me, because Christians, I, I think sometimes we get this thing messed up. All right? Is if, if, if you're proclaiming a message of grace, ought you not to be displaying grace <laughs> when you do it? <laughs> okay? Don't be... Don't, be a gracious person when we share this. But these guys were singing the praises of Jesus. And what? The world noticed. Because worship is witness, friends. He said, in everything, what? Give thanks. Rejoice always. What? That's a testimony. It's a testimony that you're trusting the God who's there. All right? So look down, verse 18, 17, 18. It says, so the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, remember that's a story that was just a week before this, okay? We're going, just going back a little ways. Continued to testify about him. Let me read that again. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, they continued to testify about him. Who, who did? Anybody who was with Jesus was testifying about 
Jesus. If you're with Jesus, if you've seen the work of Jesus, you have a story to tell. You have something to testify about, about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. And it says, those who were with him, and what were they talking about? Jesus took Lazarus out of Can you imagine retelling this story? I mean, you guys are used to this. You've read your Bibles for a while, most of you, right? You've read this story, read this story. Hey, man. You go through that whole story of Mary saying, hey, 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 it's going to stink by now. And Jesus says, just roll away the stone. Hey, you come out. It isn't great. He comes out. He's wrapped in Claws, he can't move. He's, he's mummified, all right? He's, he's kind of coming, not mummified, but you know what I'm talking about. He's wrapped up. And he says, unwrap him. Whoa, 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 wait. This, this, we buried him. Now he's coming out of the grave. Can, can, can you, we just can't even imagine this. You just, you read those stories sometimes, you don't let your imagination go. You need to let it go. Realize this is real. And these guys are going, this is what happened. So when somebody comes and tells you, hey, I was here, and Jesus did this, and Lazarus came out of the grave, and then we had lunch with him the next week. And what happens? Verse 18. For this reason also the people went and met him. Why? Because they heard that he had performed this sign. Friends, God uses our testimony about Jesus to draw others to Jesus. God uses our testimony about Jesus to draw others to Jesus. You're a part of the plan of God, and just remember, God can use donkeys, so don't worry about who you are. He'll get the job done. You know, I mean, sometimes people get all hung up on this. Can you imagine the donkey? The donkey's going into Jerusalem. Man, I am something. Look at how everybody's so excited about me. No, no, no. They're excited about who you're bringing, friends. Don't worry about being the donkey. Just worry about who you're bringing the focus to. All right? But listen, don't don't mishear me. You and I don't save people. God does. You and I can't even draw people. God does. But you and I can testify about the God who works in our life, the God who saved us, the God who's forgiven us. Listen, you're a tool in God's hand, and your voice is a key. What were they talking about? The work of Jesus Christ. That's what we ought to be talking about. Telling others what Jesus has done points them to Jesus. All right? You don't have to make them come. You can't. So don't take that responsibility on. Sometimes people walk away and say, well, I talked to them, but, they, but they, I don't know what I did wrong. They didn't listen. Jesus talked to people and they didn't listen, and Jesus did nothing wrong. Just realize not everybody's going to respond the moment you share with them, but you sharing with them is part of God's intention for you. Listen, when we share our story, The point of the story is to point to Jesus. (laughs) Don't switch lead roles here. You are not the feature. There's a movie called Witness. You're not the lead actor, okay? You are a supporting actor of what? You're pointing towards Christ, and your job is to make and reveal who Christ is. And so by talking about what Christ has done in your life, you can do that. Sometimes I think we have a hard time with this because <sighs> some of you got some stuff you maybe not rather talk about publicly <laughs> that Christ has dealt with, right? He's forgiven us all of our sins. Do you got something you could talk about? <laughs> oh, I don't want to talk about that. Did Jesus deal with that? Am I making any sense here? It got real quiet. Don't be too proud to talk about the one who rescued you and what he rescued you from, what he pulled you out of. Because there's other people that look perfectly fine stuck where you were. Don't be afraid to talk about that. That's what he did for you. It's, it's Jesus we're putting the attention on. 
And so it says, this reason the people went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. Is that appropriate? Yes. The signs were signs. <laughs> Some of you haven't got that yet. That's okay. You'll catch up later. <laughs> the signs were signs. They, they, they were directional arrows, just like the one on the screen there, saying, hey, this is the way. This is the one. This is the... They pointed something out to people. Okay? Now, what do I mean? It's communicating something. You're, you're barreling down the road. I love 199. You're barreling down the road, you know, in 199. And they use quite a few directional arrow signs on the way to the coast for reasons. <laughs> that road just keeps turning, right? Hey, you're going to be taking a turn. Listen, people only respond to good news when they hear it. You're a sign. God's done something in you. God's performed miracles in you, drawing you to himself, doing a work of forgiveness in you. You point them back to the cross. Your discussion of what Christ has done for you is always going to take people what? Back to the cross. It's what Christ did included the cross. It's not, it's not just talking about, oh, my life has got wonderfully better. No, it's what did Christ do for us? And this is really profound, but I want you to get it. People will never respond to good news they've never heard. That's the truth. Somebody told you. Do you remember who that was? I can still remember. The person who led me to Christ continued to send me spiritual birthday cards for at least another 10 years before, before she got a promotion to heaven. But she reminded me whose I was, and she told me about the Savior in a child evangelism fellowship class. And I realized as I sat there that I was headed to hell. Because even though I was a good church attender and I was a part of a Christian family, I was not trusting Christ, and I was lost without him. And I needed a Savior. And so he saved me that day when I called on him. That's my story. You guys just, I just demonstrated what I'm talking about. It's that simple. You can give the elevator version. You know, you only got three floors. Can you deliver the, can you deliver the goods? But just, it doesn't have to be long. Sermons have to be long, not, not testimony. <laughs> Fear can lock your lips but love will open your lips. If you love people more than you love yourself, if you love Jesus more than you love yourself, faith will give you words. You talk about, you want to talk about people? Then talk to God about people and he will give you the boldness to talk to them about him. Prayer is what changes things. But our Bible is full of testimonies, friends. There's the blind man getting quizzed by the Pharisees. How did he do this? How did he do this? <laughs> what did he say? I was blind. Now I see. You guys don't get that? What, what don't you understand about that? I was blind. Now I see. That's his testimony. See, John the Baptist, what was his testimony? That is the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sin of the world. Clear enough? Clear enough. It, illustrative, it's a picture. But, but you, and some of his disciples went and followed him. The woman at the well. How much theology does the woman at the well know after she had her encounter at, at, at Sychar there at the well? What does she know about Jesus? Not much. But she knows this. And so she tells people, come meet a man who told me everything I've ever done. <laughs> I don't think he's done that yet. But she knew he knew. And she knew this one knows me. Could he be the Messiah? It's interesting. She doesn't say he is the Messiah. She says, could he be the Messiah? He did all this. When she comes into town, this is a lady has got a reputation, saying, hey, he did this. What did the, what the people do? Hey, are you still in John? Flip over to John 4. It's a great little passage. John 4. So she tells them, and the people start coming out of the city to meet Jesus. Verse 39 
It says, and many from that city of the Samaritans believed in him. Why? Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. Wait, 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 wait. Tell me, he told me all the things that I have done. Is that a gospel message? Not really. But it's enough to know that there's one that knows. And they, she pointed them to Jesus. Now notice what happens. This is great. I love this. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed with there for two days, and many more believed. Why? What's your Bible say? Because of his word. See, we point people to Jesus, and then they meet Jesus. There's more to know. You don't have to give them everything. Just get them going towards Jesus, friends. You don't have to back up your evangelical dump truck and dump 20 years of theological understanding on this person who's like, ah. Uh. No, no. Just say, you know what? This one's got an answer for you. You should check this out. And they come to Jesus. We don't draw them. Notice what it says. This is great, though. They, you know, you can, you can take this two ways. Verse 42, it says, and they saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you have said that we believe. We've heard ourselves, and we know that this one is indeed what? The Savior of the world. Now, we believe that she'd had an experience that was worth checking out, so we came to Jesus. The testimony pointed them to Jesus, but then when they met Jesus, they said, this is the Savior of the world. Now, that's salvation, right? Do you understand? Your testimony can draw people towards the Savior, but they have to come to the Savior to come to salvation. Do you understand that? Whew. Who are you praying for? Who are you talking to? Who are you shared with? <laughs> Some of you know I, I had an incredible opportunity to share Christ this week. Is that a gravesite? Challenging situation. Great opportunity. Didn't have much notice. Less than 24 hours. <laughs> Come do this service. Yes, Lord. I'm going to a donkey. I want to bring Jesus to people. I don't know what your situation is, but I know who your Savior is. And, and he's worth talking about. So, hey, the sun's shining. Plant some seeds. Some of you gardeners got itchy fingers going already. I know you guys. Listen. The Bible told us Jesus is coming. Again. It told us Jesus was coming before he came. And it was specifically fulfilled precisely as he said. You go back to Daniel chapter 9, that very same prophecy that talked about the first coming also talked about the second. We'll get back there, Lord willing. But listen, I don't get to choose who trusts Jesus as Savior. But I do get to choose who I tell. I don't get to decide who will believe, but I do get to decide whether or not I will obey my Savior. And he said, you're to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Friends, the job's not done yet. There's 70,000 people in Josephine County who have no interest in planting themselves in a worshiping center about Christ on a Sunday morning. 70,000 people. That's a pretty good mission field. You don't have to go overseas. You don't have to learn a new language. You may have to learn some grace. You may have to learn some boldness. But you've got what it takes if you got Jesus. Amen? You got what it takes if you got Jesus. So I'm going to let Jesus speak up and show up. <sighs> Do whatever Jesus asks of you. <laughs> Just go get the donkey. There's sometimes some of the stuff that God has sent me on. I was like, Lord, what in the world are you doing? Your work, that's, that's the answer. I already know. It's your work, great. If it's his work, it's great. Isn't that right? Doesn't mean it feels great. Doesn't mean it looks great. Doesn't mean it turns out the way I think it should. But it'll turn out his way. The end of John, John 20, verses 30 and 31 John is summarizing his book. 
And he tells us some very significant things. It's worth a whole nother sermon, but you're not going to get it today. He says, therefore, many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The signs are to point you to Jesus so that you might find life in his name. Have you ever chosen to believe on Jesus Christ as God's Son, the Savior? Life comes from him. That's, that's the choice that will change your forever. It's the choice that will change your present. doesn't mean it will all be good feeling, but it will be good in the end. Follow Jesus Christ. Turn from sin to the Savior. We call that repentance. And I'm going to say, I shouldn't be walking this way. I need to be walking this way. Listen, how do we do that? Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter just said, Lord, save me. That simple. It's just you call on him. And do you have a plan to talk to someone about calling on him? Do you have a plan to talk to someone to say, hey, you know what? I have found a place where I get encouraged in the word every week. I have found a place where I get loved when I show up every week. That's part of your testimony, isn't it? If that's not true, then you tell me. But if that's true, what you're experiencing here, then you've got something you can share to somebody. Listen, believing in Jesus as God's Messiah gives life. And some people were drawn by God to experience that by somebody else telling their story and by realizing that this is the fulfillment of the word of God. And that's one of the great things we can do is point people back to the word of God. Did you know that the Bible says, I've had that conversation with people again and again, did you know that the Bible says, can, can I share with you sometime how the Bible says you can have a relationship with God? When people are asking the question, who is this? They're still asking it today. They just don't tend to ask it that way. It's more like, how could you possibly believe in a God who lets this happen? They're asking, who is this? Where was God when they're asking, who is this? You know, the, the questions don't always look the same, but the question is still the same. Who is this? Listen, friends, here's the, here's the issue. Trust God's word. He keeps every promise. All right? And tell your stories about Jesus. Notice I didn't just say tell your stories. <laughs> some of you got some good stories. That's great. Tell your stories about Jesus. <laughs> All right? And then believe on Jesus. If you've never made that choice, today's the day. There's no better day than to turn to the Savior than today. Because we don't know that we get tomorrow. But we got today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you have given us a glorious gospel. This book reveals to us truth in amazing depth and breadth. The way that you have worked century upon century, millennia, to reveal to us that we could trust you the stories that you've put in here that we know that we can trust you and the way that you've worked in our individual lives to draw us to you. Thank you for being so personal. Thank you for being so loving. By all means, please work in our lives that these lips of ours would open freely in praise, would open freely in testimony, would open freely to tell people about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Oh, Lord, would you use us this week to bring Jesus to somebody in our circle? Lord, every person here, would you use us to bring Jesus to somebody in our circle? That you decide whether or not they get saved, but would we just speak up for you? For all you've done, we say thank you. We love you. You are a great, a glorious, loving God. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand and sing about the day. Death. <laughs>